Well, my name is Hans George Campbell, and in today's episode of Retro Geek Computers, um, I'm going to be showing you a slideshow, or narrating a slideshow, about the Amiga 500 tower that I built. In this first picture, this is an Enlight uh, PC tower case. I uh, drilled out the rivets and removed the original back piece, and I used that back piece as a template to to draw around a piece of aluminum sheeting to make a new piece, a new back plate to, to go on the back. And I'll show you that in the next picture. Um, I also drilled out and removed, you know, drilled out the rivets and removed the the uh, the metal pieces for the dry bays. Uh, it was a four dry bay uh, chassis system, and it was a little bit too long. It, it uh, didn't allow for the uh, the Amiga 500 motherboard to be installed properly, and also I only needed the the top two dry bays. So what I did, I, I cut those two metal pieces in half, and after cutting them, uh, I filed the uh, the metal so you know to get rid of the the, uh, the sharp edges. I don't want to cut myself, and then I remounted those pieces with uh, 440 bolts and lock nuts back into the case, and, and it worked out really well. Um, the picture shows my rivet gun, but I, you know, I was originally going to rivet the pieces back in place, but then I decided, no, I'd much rather use the 440 bolts and and, uh, and lock nuts. Anyway, let's go to the next picture. Okay, this shows the custom aluminum piece. Uh, I went down to my local Ace Hardware store and I bought the thickest aluminum sheeting that they had. Uh, I believe this is like almost 3 sixteenths of an inch thick. It's a really thick, high quality piece of aluminum. And like I said before, I used the original back piece of the Enlight Tower case as a template and I drew around, you know, I drew the, uh, uh, drew around the, the uh, template on this uh, aluminum piece and then cut it and filed the edges nice and smooth and, and rounded the corners just slightly and you know made it look real nice professional and then I drilled and filed the holes for the keyboard connector the mouse connector joystick connector and the VGA port and the right and left uh, audio also the holes for the uh, for mounting the for screwing into the uh, the standoffs uh, that are mounted on the uh, the super memory expansion board and after I cut the holes it took about a week to for me to make this uh, this custom back piece it took about a week I took my time and and did a good job on it uh, but after I finished um, I washed the aluminum and dried it and uh, and then I took a piece of very fine steel wool and I buffed it in one direction, one direction only, with fine steel wool to create that brushed aluminum effect. And I think it turned out really good. It's got that 70s look, you know, hi-fi stereo equipment, you know, 70s look. And it, it turned out really good. And after I did that, I rewashed the uh, the part and rinsed it and uh, let it air dry overnight. And I think it turned out pretty good. This is the end result of, of all that. We're about a week's worth of, uh, of work. Okay, this is the finished product, my Mega 500 tower. And uh, this is the second one that I ever built. It turned out much better than the first one. Um, you notice I got a GoTech drive as DF0. I've got a genuine Sony drive as DF1. Sony invented the three and a half inch disk drive, so whenever possible, I prefer using Sony disk drives. And a friend of mine, he and he cut and engraved the solid brass, red with gold lettering uh, badges that you see uh, mounted on the front of the case. It says Amiga 500T. Okay. Um, the power LED actually works and the reset button works. Okay, this is the rear of the case. As you can see, the custom uh, aluminum piece is mounted. I use 440 bolts with, uh, with lock nuts. 
and the top connector is the keyboard connector. You can use any Amiga 2000 or 3000 keyboard, just plug it right in, or an Amiga 4000 keyboard with an adapter. Uh, the next connector is the joystick, or excuse me, the mouse connector. The next connector is the joystick connector, then the VGA connector, and the right and left uh, audio connectors. And then you also see the bolts going into the standoffs for mounting, uh, for securing the uh, the Supra memory expansion board. Okay, and on the bottom of the case, uh, you'll notice some nice uh, rubber feet. Okay, this is a picture showing the inside, uh, how I mounted the motherboard and uh, mounted the drives and. And the power supply was made by Micro R and D. It's it's a big it's their Bigfoot power supply that they designed or made for the uh, Amiga 500, 600, and 1200 uh, computers. Uh, basically, all it is is a, a small ATX power supply with an extra cable added for the Amiga uh, computers. Um, anyway, we'll go to the next picture. Okay, this is the RGB, the VGA board, and uh, this board I highly recommend for use with the Amiga computers. It works really well, especially with the Amiga 500 and, and the 2000 computers. Um, basically, it, it is a flicker fixer. It gets rid of the flickering. Um, it also upscales the Amiga's native uh, screen modes to a much higher resolution that's required for today's modern um, monitors, you know, and, and HDTVs. And it produces a very nice picture. It really does. I highly recommend this board. You can pick them up on eBay for about, you know, around 30 bucks. I think is what I paid for this one. Uh, they work really good. You got to supply 5 volts, 2 amps to the board. That's what that black and red, uh, those black and red wires are for. And then, uh, coming from the Amiga 500 motherboard's RGB port, uh, there's wires that plug into uh, this, this adapter board here. And the signals that are being used is the, the red, green, and blue, the ground, and the composite sync. For some reason, the board doesn't like the Amiga's uh, separate uh, horizontal sync and vertical sync, which actually produces a much clearer signal than composite sync. But even though it uses the composite sync, it still puts out a very nice uh, signal, a very good picture, and I highly recommend this board. The only, uh, excuse me, the only problem um, with this board is that the main chip that has the aluminum heat sink mounted on it it gets very hot. It gets so hot that I think the the chip will not last very long. Uh, the heat will will greatly lower the life expectancy of that chip. Also, the chip gets so hot that it produces artifacting or noise in your video output. You can see it on on the Amiga screen, okay, or on your TV or whatever. In fact, a lot of people look about that and because of that they think the board is crap but no the board works very well if you do this one thing that chip must be air cooled it must be fan cooled and as you can see in this picture here I got a muffin fan that blows air over that heat sink and it keeps that chip nice and cool and it works really well this board works really well I highly recommend it okay the orange wired cable is my custom uh, VGA extension cable and as you can see I soldered everything and heat shrunk all the soldered uh, connections. I mounted the RGB the VGA board on aluminum standoffs it's nice and, and secure. I mounted the 80 millimeter muffin fan on right angle uh, brackets and, uh, and it, it all works really well. Okay, in this picture, we see a better view of the rear of the connectors, how I did the keyboard connector, the mouse and joystick connector, the VGA connector, and the audio uh, connectors. 
Um, you also see the Supra, well, the rear of the Supra memory expansion board. You also see the mil spec 68000 microprocessor running at 8 megahertz. I do not recommend installing a 68010 in an Amiga 500 or 2000. You also see the chip, uh, the one megabyte chip memory upgrade that I did. I installed uh, four sockets and the four extra memory chips and the four extra capacitors, filtering capacitors, to uh, increase the memory from 512K to one megabyte of chip memory. I also changed out the Agnes. Originally it had a 512K Agnes. Uh, now it's a one meg uh, Agnes chip. And then I also installed a Super Denise chip. Um, the Kickstart is version 1.3. Yes, you heard me right. Kickstart 1.3. I do not recommend using Kickstart 2.04 or Kickstart 3.1 with a classic Amiga 500 or 2000 system, especially one that you're going to be used mainly for playing games or running all the older software. And the reason for that, the Amiga was released in 1985, and the new chipsets and, and the new uh, kickstarts and workbenches, they weren't released until after 1990. So, and, and Commodore went out of business around what, 1995? So during the 10 years that Commodore was, was building Amiga computers, half of that time was the original chipset and Kickstart 1.2, 1.3. And during those five years, okay, the majority of the Amiga software, I'd say at least 80 to 90 percent of all Amiga software was produced during that first five years. So what does that tell you? That tells you that the majority of Amiga software was written and designed for the OCS chipset and Kickstart 1.3. Okay, so that's how I built this Amiga 500 tower. I wanted a classic machine that uh, was compatible compatible with just about all the Amiga games, and I can run Deluxe Paint 3 on it, uh, I can do Age of Sonics, uh, Deluxe Music Construction Set, um, I can listen to my mod music, my classic trackers and, and all the demos and things, and they would all run flawlessly on this system. I don't have to use you know HDW load and go through all that unnecessary crap that most of you people go through. Okay, So that's why I chose Kickstart 1.3 in this system. Okay, in this picture it shows how I did the RGB wires. You know, I used a 23-pin uh, uh, housing and um, I actually bought a 23-pin connector off of eBay and soldered on the five wires that are needed by the RGB to VGA adapter board. And the other end of those wires, of course, plug into the, uh, the adapter board. It also shows how I did the power connector. Um, and it shows how I wire tied uh, the wires to keep everything nice and neat. It also shows in this picture how I had uh, routed the ribbon cables and the audio cable and wire tied them so they're nice and flat and everything's nice and neat. I like my stuff neat. Okay, this shows um, how I did DF1. I basically took an external Amiga disk drive, I took it apart, and I, uh, I cut, I removed the, uh, the board, and I cut the bottom part, the bottom metal part of the case, and mounted that into the, the, the tower case here, as you can see. And then I reinstalled the board and the cable, and plugged it into uh, the external disk drive connector. And that allows me just to plug in a normal ribbon cable and then just plug in my, uh, my 880K disk drive. Um, and it works out really well. Actually, it looks like I installed a Shinon disk drive, but it's one of the higher quality ones instead of the Sony 
uh, drive. I think my other, my first Amiga 500 tower has the Sony disk drive. Yeah, this is the Shenon disk drive. Okay. But anyway, it shows how I did everything. Um, this shows how I did the uh, the mouse, joystick, audio, and disk drive cabling, you know, up on top. And I use a wire tie to secure the top part of the disk drive connector to the chassis part of the case. And what that was for is just for safety. It's so that I don't, if I was to accidentally pull too hard on that disk drive cable, it's not going to snap the uh, the floppy disk connector off of that Amiga 500 motherboard. So it just holds it secure and uh, it makes it more stable. You know. Also in this picture, you can see how I did the um, how I mounted the the disk drive brackets or, or the uh, the metal pieces. They're actually bolted in into the uh, the frame. The ribbon cable coming from the Amiga 500 motherboard that goes into the GoTek drive. Okay, in this final picture, you see the GoTek drive, and it's got a four megabyte, uh, excuse me, four gigabyte uh, micro memory stick plugged in. And this GoTek drive, I have to, I have to admit, uh, it, it works really well. I have a custom workbench, Workbench 1.3, that I designed and, and built for this system, and. Um, and I have all my favorite programs and my favorite games on the on the memory stick, and it works really good. And you can also see the front of the uh, the disk drive, and you can see the green uh, power LED and the the reset button. Uh, this computer, because of the way it's done, you the Control A A will not work on the keyboard, but you don't really need that. There is all, all, all that does is it activates a reset circuit that is on the Amiga 500 motherboard. Okay, and you can do the same thing with two wires going to a reset. I mean, to a momentary switch, or in this case, the reset switch. You hold the the switch in for five seconds and release it, and it resets the uh, the Amiga, and it works very well. It basically does the same thing as if you pressed Control A A. It does the same thing. Now this reset circuitry on the Amiga 2000 is not on the motherboard. It's actually part of the Amiga 2000 keyboard. Okay, and also the 3000 keyboard. But on the Amiga 500, the reset circuitry is on the motherboard. As far as I know, from, from what I remember reading and, and you know, reading about the Amiga 500 and the 2000. Because I was wondering, I was curious about this. Okay, how am I going to do the control AA? Because I don't want to keep switching the power on and off. You know, it's going to wear out the power switch. Even if I use like a surge suppressor or something like that. You know, I want to be able to just, you know, reset the computer, do a warm, you know, reset. So uh, I was, you know, looking online, uh, trying to figure out how I'm going to do it. And I came across this, this uh, website that actually showed how to hook a switch to the reset circuitry of the Amiga 500 uh, computer. Anyway, that's it. This is my Amiga 500 tower computer that I built. Uh, my name is Hans George Campbell and until next time you have been watching Retro Geek Computers.